Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the western seaboard of the coast of British Columbia, Canada. A remote timber operation in the rugged and forested hillside near a place called Draney Inlet off of the River Inlet area is our destination. The west coast of Canada is the largest temperate rainforest in the world and is only one of seven around the planet. This designation means that the area receives more than 55 inches of rainfall each year, providing an abundance of plant life that directly or indirectly supports an abundance of animal life. The forest canopy consists of towering pine, fir, cedar, and spruce trees that cast a protective shade over the rhododendron, maple, and dogwood trees in the lower canopy. Berry bushes include salmon berries and blackberries, plus a few more. In this wet and mild environment, mosses, mushrooms, and other fungi thrive while consuming the dead plant mass that gathers on the forest floors. Common animals in this area include Roosevelt elk, moose, and black-tailed deer. To keep these forest plant browsers' populations in check, the predators of the area include cougars, wolves, black bears, and grizzly bears. The month of March is a transitional time for the grizzlies of this area. Any snow that may have accumulated is melting off, which allows the nutritious sedge grass and other plants to grow. Feeding on spring sprouts is a vital part of grizzly seasonal cycles, as the grass provides needed vitamins and minerals depleted during hibernation, and the fiber in the grass cleanses their digestive system. It is also the time when protective sows bring their little cubs out to learn the life skills she will instill in them over the next few years. Sows are extremely protective during this time and are a danger to humans and male bears alike. When grizzlies emerge from their dens, they are essentially starving, having not eaten for months. Given that the salmon runs may be several weeks away, if they don't find food soon after emerging, they may not fatten up fast enough for the next hibernation. They depend on the forest for their livelihood, just like Ryan Arsenal did. He was a forest engineer with Capacity Forest Management for the past eight years. Ryan would spend part of his time working from the corporate office, but the rest of his time he was out at the remote logging camps, marking trees selected for harvest. He's from a small town on the east side of Vancouver Island called Campbell River, which is where his wife and two young daughters stayed. Ryan would happily reunite with his family when he wasn't working at the remote camps, but while he was out there, he worked very hard. In his role with the company, Ryan would assess the cutting zone, which is the portion of the forest the company was targeting to pull timber from. After that, he would go through and paint or tape tree species that the timber company was permitted to harvest. The company placed a lot of trust in Ryan, and he was considered part of the heart and soul of the organization. It is hard to imagine that such a beautiful place would present or conceal any danger, but Ryan and his logging teams routinely ran into black bears and grizzly bears. The bears never seemed interested in being around people, and if you saw them at all, you saw them leaving. They simply had too much food in their habitat to even consider stalking a human being, which would be far from their typical fare in the forest. At around 10.30 a.m. of March 22, 2017, Ryan worked his way through a stand of trees as he maintained visual contact with his four other crewmen. Company policy required a close working distance to prevent injuries and ensure their workers were safe and accounted for. The crewmen hadn't noticed anything out of the ordinary. They heard no growls or roars. There were no grizzly tracks or scat that they found. None of them saw the enraged grizzly that appeared out of nowhere, only a few yards from Ryan. As soon as Ryan saw the grizzly, he hid behind the only tree he could find, which is a very small pine tree. Ryan tried to startle the angry bear by yelling and screaming at it as it approached him. Nothing Ryan could do seemed to dissuade the grizzly as it charged toward him. He lifted his heavy logging boots and kicked the grizzly right in the muzzle, but all that did was give the bear Ryan's right leg to pull him down with. The bear drove him onto his back before any of the other crewmen could react. The other loggers looked on in horror as the bear clamped onto Ryan's lower right leg, shattering his fibula bone as it did so in a single bite. The grizzly quickly switched its attack to Ryan's head and tore a huge gash across his scalp. Ryan threw his hands up around his head, hoping that the bear would spare him any more pain. Bears aren't known for acknowledging the pain of their prey, though. The grizzly drove its enormous canines right through Ryan's wrist as he feebly tried to protect his skull from being crushed. 
The entire time the bear was breaking Ryan's bones and tearing his flesh with its jaws, its claws were raking him all over his upper torso. Fortunately for him, his thick work vest bore the brunt of nearly all of it and spared him additional trauma. The five lumber workers were not unprepared for this. The company issued them bear spray to use in just this kind of instance. It just happened so quickly that they couldn't respond before the bear inflicted crippling damage on Ryan's body. As the others watched Ryan scream and fight with the grizzly, one of them dug through the pocket of a small pack, searching for the bear spray. Once he took hold of it, he let out a primal holler as he ran toward the bear while directing the orange cloud into the bear's face. As soon as the bear lifted its head from Ryan and its nostrils and eyes filled with the bear spray, it began coughing and gagging. The bear spray had a potent and immediate effect on the bear as it broke off the attack on Ryan and took refuge in the nearby brush. His fellow crewmen rushed to Ryan's side as he lay on his back in obvious and severe pain. The large laceration on his scalp poured blood, and the injuries to his wrist and lower right leg left his limbs non-functional and bent abnormally in places. After quickly assessing Ryan's injuries, the other crewmen radioed their base and requested a helicopter to his location. They administered first aid as best they could while they waited for its arrival. Given the rugged and steep terrain, the helicopter couldn't land near Ryan, so they carried a stretcher downhill for three hours to get to him. As the first aid crew approached Ryan's location with the stretcher, the grizzly emerged from the brush and charged toward them. There were several men in this group, and that seemed to be a good reason for the grizzly to break off its attack on them. It seemed confused as it turned back into the brush and disappeared. The medical team loaded Ryan onto the stretcher after checking out his wounds. The helicopter immediately flew Ryan to the medical center at Port Hardy, where he received a blood transfusion, as well as staples to close the gash on his scalp. Shortly after that, he was flown to the Victoria General Hospital in Victoria, B.C. for antibiotic treatment and further surgical repair to his broken bones and shredded tissues in his arm and right leg. The medical staff at both facilities described Ryan's wounds as major injuries and very serious. Ryan had a prolonged recovery with many months of painful and difficult physical rehabilitation before regaining basic function and use of his injured arm and right leg. I could find no source indicating if Ryan terminated his employment with the logging company so it's assumed that he remained with the organization. Immediately after the bear attack, Capacity Forest Management worked with wildlife officials to deploy a specialized predator attack team to conduct an investigation. They could not locate the bear as Ed fled following the second attack on the crewman. The logging company acted very quickly in response to the attack by providing trauma counseling to the crewman. Ryan's family had some difficulty in dealing with the implications of his grizzly attack, but were comforted by the knowledge that he would survive. If the timber company hadn't taken the proactive steps of training their loggers how to handle confrontations with wildlife and how to dispense bear spray, Ryan's situation may have easily ended in his death. A company spokesman stated that this was a purpose-driven bear that had a reason for being where it was. This ominous statement shed light on what they believed was the nature of the attack. They expressed gratitude for the brave response of Ryan's fellow crewmen and that the bear was unable to get his head in its mouth as it tried to do. British Columbia Conservation Service Officer Scott Norris described the attack as a major attack and stated that it wasn't cut and dry in terms of what would be the response to the bear's behavior. A biologist who specialized in carnivores was consulted to understand the bear's behavior. He noted that given there were no cubs observed during either of the bear's attacks on the crewman, it is doubted to be a sow protecting her cubs. A further assumption was made that it was the same bear that attacked Ryan as well as charged the rescue party. They concluded that bears don't typically hunt humans, so jumping to the conclusion that it attacked out of hunger may be an errant decision. The Ministry of Environment decided after much consideration that the bear was acting defensively and that it would not be destroyed. It didn't try to claim Ryan as its food cache and didn't return to the attack site. But this was biased based on the intervention of his co-workers. The bear may have returned had they not intervened in such a powerful and brave manner. They decided to let it live and hope it would have no further hostile interactions with humans. In 2018, authorities estimated that there were 14,925 grizzlies in all of British Columbia. Now that seems to be a pretty precise number to me, and I have to wonder about the methods they used to arrive at this tally. In the year 2015 alone, there were four grizzly attacks on humans. Since 1984, there have been six human fatalities due to grizzly bear attacks and 94 injuries recorded in British Columbia alone. 
That roughly calculates out to one human fatality every 6.2 years, and about two injuries each year from grizzlies. After reviewing the details of Ryan Arsenault's grizzly bear mauling, I'm left with a few questions for you. Do you think that bear attacked out of predatory or defensive motives? Given the speed of the attack, do you think a firearm would have prevented this attack? Are you surprised that the logging company didn't provide shotguns loaded with slugs as well as bear spray for the crewman's safety? Why do you think there are so many bear attacks on loggers? I'll gladly read and respond to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to familiar territory, a place where bears can be very angry if they are disturbed, surprised, or just having a bad day. Well, I guess that describes anywhere that bears reside, so specifically, we are going to the Madison Valley in western Montana. This area may sound familiar if you have watched our episode regarding the fatal grizzly mauling on Charles Mock, but it happened only a few miles away. The Madison Valley is just across the good side of the border of Idaho and Montana, and is within the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, which sprawls across the northwest corner of Wyoming, the southwest corner of Montana, and the northeast corner of Idaho, well past the park boundaries. In this area, the needs of people and bears are precariously balanced by regulations, laws, and constraints on human activity. You might even say that only the foolhardy would adventure into grizzly country here, even if they are well prepared. The Madison Valley stretches north from the park toward a small farming town called Ennis. In the broad valley, the land is flat and covered with grasses and sagebrush that antelope and coyotes dash across. As the valley inclines to peaks that reach around 10,000 feet in elevation, stands of fir, pine, aspen, and spruce cover the ground in a green blanket that hides mule deer, white-tailed deer, elk, and moose. The predators of this area include cougars, wolves, black bears, and grizzly bears. To clarify the difference between a brown bear and a grizzly bear, grizzly bears are brown bears, but the name is typically used to reference smaller and more aggressive inland brown bears who usually do not have the benefit of a seasonal salmon run to fatten up like the coastal brownies do along the west coast of Canada and Alaska. Their life is more demanding, given they have to compete over the same food sources as black bears, and even some that wolves and cougars eat. With four large apex predators in this area, it is no wonder that sow grizzlies defend the lives of their cubs with such ferocity and power. In the early morning twilight of October 1, 2016, 50-year-old Todd Orr was planning on using a day off from work to go scouting for elk hunting season. Todd is a fit and tough trail engineer. Whenever a park system or national forest wants to install a new trail route, they call Todd, and he examines the topography and destinations of the proposed trail and designs routes that provide the best views and connect to the existing trails. He was raised in Bozeman, and like so many other people from the area, loved it so much he never left. Todd has found one of those jobs that aren't work because he gets to do what he loves, which is being outdoors. He is an avid hunter and fly fisherman and hikes for relaxation and exercise. His job allows him to pursue his favorite pastimes, which include designing and building custom knives. On his scouting excursion, he was packing a 10mm pistol and his bear spray because he is a realist and knows that a bear can be anywhere in this area. His handgun is stashed in a chest holster and his bear spray is holstered on his right hip for easy and quick access. He is also very well versed in reading a bear's body language and behavior to ascertain what their state of mind might be. As a precaution to avoid running into a moose or a bear, Todd yelled out, Hey, bear! every few minutes as he climbed the trail into the high country to make sure any nearby animals know he is there. About three miles up the trail, Todd entered a small clearing and noticed on the other side, about 80 yards away, a large grizzly bear, as well as her two little cubs. The cubs were born in the past winter and were probably about nine months old by now, weighing around 20 to 25 pounds. As soon as the sow and cubs saw Todd, they immediately headed in the opposite direction, giving him a false sense of security at the thought of their apparent retreat from a human presence. Little did Todd know the sow had headed her cubs up the hill a bit and ordered them up a tree. Then she circled back toward him. As Todd patiently waited to see where the bears had gone, she bore down on him and closed the distance with stunning speed. As Todd continued up the trail, he briefly looked at the ground as he stepped and suddenly heard a noise above him on the hill. He quickly glanced up and saw the 400-pound furious sow grizzly focused on him, eyes burning with rage. 
She was hell-bent on taking out what she perceived as a threat to her cubs, and nothing could change her mind. Just to understand a protective mama bear's perspective a bit, let's take a second to discuss why they react the way they do to perceived threats. In the bear world, the greatest threat to those tiny cute bear cubs is a big old grumpy boar who is driven by, let's say, biological urges. Somehow boars know that if they kill a sow's cubs, she will be brought back into heat, or a state of biological readiness to mate. The boar will get to feed off of the cubs and sometime later get the chance of breeding her. Female bears know this and react to any threat to their cubs, real or imagined, with a near-nuclear display of power and aggression. A sow grizzly has even been filmed sprinting a quarter mile down a steep incline to climb a tree to attack and kill a boar black bear after smelling his scent on the breeze. They do not know mercy or tolerance when it comes to anything that can harm their cubs. Todd began to shout at the sow as soon as he saw her charging toward him. Hoping she may have misunderstood what he was, he waved his arms and yelled to show her he was a harmless human and not a threatening boar. Well, Todd didn't get to wave his arms more than just a few times before he realized this sow was not bluff charging. When a bear bluff charges, they tend to bounce and peek at what they are headed toward as if searching for more information. When a bear is not bluff charging, their eyes are fixed on their target and there is no hesitation in their approach. He quickly reached down to pull out his can of bear spray and flick the trigger guard off in a practiced motion. Bear spray manufacturers recommend discharging the noxious cloud of irritant when the bear is within 25 to 35 feet for optimal effect. Todd estimated that he discharged his bear spray when the sow was 25 feet from him. He watched as the orange cloud billowed from the canister and settled into a hazy layer of hopeful protection between him and the sow, hoping and expecting, but really hoping that the bear would get a snoot full of that cloud and decide she didn't want to mess with anything that painful. Todd's hopes were terrifyingly dashed when the sow blurred right through the cloud as if it wasn't there. The bear spray had no immediate effect on the sow and she shoved Todd to the ground. Todd knew he had to protect his neck and head most and curled up into a ball with his hands covering his neck. With his face in the dirt, the bear rapidly and repeatedly bit his left arm several times and bit his back a few times as well. She fortunately took out some of her frustration on his backpack, which prevented even more damage to Todd's vulnerable body. The sow bit into Todd to try to elicit a reaction and waited a few seconds, then bit again in another location on his body. She did this several times over a few minutes before she started coughing in response to the bear spray emitted earlier. She broke off the attack and coughed her way back up the hill and toward her cubs. Now relieved by the departure of the sow and bewildered at how he was still alive, Todd slowly made it back to his feet. His eyes and legs worked fine, even though his arm and shoulder were severely and repeatedly bitten. He knew he had to get off that hill and back to his truck to get to medical help soon, and started jogging back down the trail. After he covered a couple hundred yards, Todd decided he had better check out his injuries. He could see blood seeping from several puncture wounds on his arms and shoulder, but knew these were not life-threatening. He thanked God out loud that they weren't worse as he briskly hiked. The most important thing to him right now was not to bandage his wounds, but to get as far away as he could from that angry sow as quickly as possible. Several minutes down the trail, Todd heard another noise behind him and saw a blur out of the corner of his left eye. About thirty feet from him, the sow had returned and was now charging him again at full speed. The feeling of elation at getting off so easy on the first attack drained from his body as he had no bear spray this time, and the sow was not slowing down as she approached him. Todd again assumed the position he had used earlier to protect his neck and head. He flopped face first into the ground and wrapped his arms around his neck and head in anticipation of the follow-up attack. As she approached him, the sow used his shoulders as a stopping pad as she placed both her paws on them, crushing him into the ground. Her teeth again pierced the flesh of his arms and shoulders with bites Todd described as being hit by a sledgehammer with teeth. As she drove her canines through his forearm, Todd heard his bones pop from the bite pressure. Everything from the point of the bite to his fingertips went numb and limp, flopping uselessly as he struggled to cover himself. As the pain from the bite to his forearm shot through his body, Todd let out a gasp and twitched in response. This was the proof of life the sow needed to re-energize her attack on him. She quickly bit him hard, several times all over his shoulders and upper back. Todd fought the instinct to react to the pain. 
Each time he gasped or twitched in reaction to the bites, the sow would follow up with several more bites. He tried to lay still as she began to chew on his head, now that his arm was limp and not protecting it. On about her third bite to Todd's head, he felt a flood of warm blood pour over his face. She had opened up a deep gash about five inches long, just above his ear, and partially displaced a small patch of his scalp. The pictures of this wound are gory, to say the least, and would not pass YouTube scrutiny, so I have posted them on my Patreon, which is linked below, along with other pictures from Todd's attack. They are fairly gut-wrenching, so view them at your own risk. They do show you just how thick the scalp tissues are on a human being, which is quite interesting, but yet yeah, definitely not for young people to see. After feeling such a flood of blood flow into his eyes and down his face, Todd was certain the sow was going to finish him off this time. He helplessly awaited a crushing bite to his skull as he resigned to the fact the sow grizzly was going to kill him. Apparently tearing a man limb from limb can be exhausting, even for an enormous apex predator. The sow suddenly stopped after nearly scalping Todd and pressed her full weight onto his back, crushing the air from his lungs. He knew if he so much as twitched, she might renew her attack, so he laid still, listening to the silence interrupted only by the sounds of the sow breathing heavily and sniffing him. Her warm breath pelted the back of his neck rhythmically as she assessed if Todd was dead and the threat to her cubs ended. Her paws were pressed into his lower back, and he could feel them digging into his flesh as she angrily watched him for any sign of life. The putrid scent of the sow filled Todd's nostrils and made resisting any movement even more difficult. The sow remained positioned this way over Todd for about thirty seconds. As suddenly as she appeared, she disappeared. Undoubtedly, concern for her cubs had changed her focus now that Todd had ceased all movement. She had proven her point to Todd and any boar grizzlies that may have seen her violent intent to protect her cubs. Todd wanted to see where the sow was, but was too afraid to move. His eyes were full of his own blood, which completely obscured any detail in his vision. He knew he wouldn't survive a third round with the angry sow, and slowly maneuvered his arm beneath his chest in search of his 10mm pistol. It was gone. Wiping the blood from his eyes, Todd lifted his head, searching for the solace of knowing the sow had, in fact, finally left him. He searched the ground around him and located his pistol still in its holster only five feet away. During the attack, the sow had cut the binding to his holster, holding it to his chest, allowing it to tumble the short distance. His backpack was mutilated and served as a harbinger of the damage that would have otherwise been done to his back. Todd quickly gathered up his scattered belongings and resumed his descent toward his truck. Blood poured from the gash above his ear and the twenty-five other bites all over his body. He knew he had about forty-five more minutes of hiking before reaching safety and determined that he wasn't about to let himself bleed out without trying to make it. He resumed alternating between brisk hiking and jogging back down the trail. When Todd reached the trailhead he could see another vehicle parked near his own. His mind immediately jumped to the thought of that person also running into the angry sow. He had the wherewithal to pull out his cell phone and immediately record the results of the day's adventure on it as he dripped blood all over the cab of his truck. A short distance down the road, Todd approached a rancher. He waved the rancher down and asked him to call the hospital to let them know he was coming and would need immediate medical care. Just to prove how tough he was, Todd called his girlfriend as soon as he got reception on his cell phone. He calmly asked her how her day was going and asked her if she wouldn't mind bringing him a change of clothes to the hospital. When Todd pulled up to the hospital, he was met by a full medical team as well as a police officer. He asked the officer to open his truck door, put his truck in park, and unfasten his seat belt, since his left arm was numb and useless. The officer was glad to see that through it all, Todd had still remembered to buckle his seat belt. Todd was rushed inside and an assessment was underway to get a good measure of the damage the sow had done to his body. His limp left wrist was x-rayed and it was noted that the bear had chipped his ulna when biting into it, causing the nerves that controlled his wrist and hand to stop working. It took the medical team eight hours to stitch up all of Todd's wounds where his flesh was punctured and torn by the bear's powerful jaws. By morning time, Todd's bruises were a dark palette of green, purple, and blue and covered his entire upper arm, shoulders, and parts of his back. Many of the bruises were due to bites that didn't quite puncture or tear his skin, but nonetheless ruptured blood vessels underneath. Dark bruises in the shape of bear paws had emerged from where the bear stood on his back while waiting for him to move. 
From being crushed into the ground by the sow, Todd had bruises all over his face and chest as well. In typical tough Montanan fashion, Todd described the day's events as not his best day and expressed gratitude at being alive to share this moment with his loved ones. Madison County Sheriff Roger Thompson urged Todd to buy a lottery ticket, stating that luck had to be on his side to survive two bear attacks on the same day. Sheriff Thompson likened Todd's attack to being struck by lightning twice on the same day. Todd's girlfriend added to the comedy by stating that it looked like he had gutted an elk in the driver's seat of his truck. Todd Orr did everything he was supposed to do, right down to having the discipline and self-control to lay still while being bitten 25 times by the angry sow. Todd was grateful that there was no one else with him when he encountered the sow and her cubs. He knew he would do anything to protect his friends, just like that sow had risked her life defending her cubs. Todd is committed to continue hiking and hunting as soon as he has recovered from his injuries. He even went out fly fishing while his left arm was still in a splint, in the episode regarding Bram Schaefer's grizzly bear attack, while he was elk hunting with his father, the toughness of folks from Montana was showcased, and Todd Orr's attack reinforces just how tough they are. Regarding the sow and her cubs, there was a brief discussion amongst the officials on what action they should take to address her aggressive behavior. I could find no source indicating that she and her cubs were ever pursued, collared, or killed, and assume she was left alone to raise her babies in peace. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I'm left with a few questions for you. Was it the same bear that attacked Todd twice, or did he run into a second angry grizz? Do you think that Todd deployed his bear spray at the correct distance, or did he deploy it too early? Do you think the bear took it easy on Todd, or was she trying to kill him? Are you surprised the bear attacked him again after being sprayed with bear spray? Do you think the angry grizz followed Todd down the hill to attack him again, or did they simply cross paths again, causing the second attack? Finally, which one do you think would be worse to deal with, an angry sow grizzly protecting her babies, or a tough Montanan who would take a lickin' and keep on ticking? I will be glad to read and respond to your thoughts, so post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the beautiful and rugged mountains of West Virginia, to a ridge called Cheat Mountain. This mountain is one of the highest ridges in the Monongahela National Forest, reaching heights of around 4,800 feet. It is covered with forests of spruce trees and various hardwoods. A century ago, all but a few hundred acres of West Virginia was logged, leaving very little old-growth forest, but what is there is near the Cheat River. The out-of-control logging created patches of what are called second and third-growth forests. If you recall in previous videos on our channel, we have talked about forest succession, which starts when the land is cleared through fire, landslide, or logging. The first plants that return are grasses and small bushes, and is considered the first growth. This stage is followed by larger bushes and small trees, which is considered the second growth. It is frequently low visibility and extremely difficult to get through with all of the smaller plants and trees intertwining in competition for resources. As the small trees turn into larger trees over decades, the resource demand and shade they <laughs> their canopies shape the pockets of brush and the number of young trees in any given area. At this point in succession, the mature forest has returned and is the most navigable by humans of any other state of forest succession. The impact of such rapid and heavy logging activity devastated wildlife and only recently is the area recovering. Much of the state would now be considered to be second and third growth forest. There are only a few species affected by the excessive logging activity still on the endangered species list, including the West Virginia flying squirrel and the Cheat Mountain salamander. Beyond the timber management issues, West Virginia is the only state in the U.S. that has a year-round bear pursuit season. That means that houndsmen can turn their dogs loose on a bear scent trail at any point in the year and chase them until they are treed. After that, they are required to regain control and possession of their hounds, allowing the bear to climb back down the tree and go back to being a bear. On August 2, 2007, half-brothers Phil Propst and Willie Starks rose at 5 a.m. They had been preparing to take their hounds out for a run on a bear scent trail, which was one of their favorite pastimes. They enjoyed it so much that they would take the hounds out a few times a week, some weeks. 
In West Virginia, bear take season is only a month long in the area where the brothers lived, and the bears here can be 600 pounds on rare occasions. The brothers had a pack of hounds that included a few different breeds. They had red bone hounds, walkers, mountain curs, and black and tans in their hound pack and had painstakingly built their pack over the past several years. The brothers had started their hound pack for hunting raccoons in their childhood, with their father initially. As they got older, they hunted raccoons together, then fell in with a group of houndsmen who pursued bears. They enjoyed the pursuit so much that they eventually gave up killing the bears and focused on the pursuit season only. Phil became so enamored with pursuing the bears that he stopped carrying a firearm with him and clearly didn't carry bear spray. He explained the logic behind this decision by stating that you don't have to kill anything if you get into a spot. You have to figure out a way to get your hounds controlled and removed without shooting and killing the bear. For some reason, that sounds like West Virginia logic, but is definitely beyond my comprehension. Phil and Willie loaded up 10 of their 12 hounds and made the drive up U.S. Highway 250 toward Cheat Mountain Summit. When they arrived at the turnoff that goes to Godnear Knob Fire Tower, they took their hound with the best nose and chained him to the top of the kennel, mounted in the back of their truck. Their usual practice is to slowly drive down the road, allowing the dog on the top of the kennel, called a strike dog, to get a great position to sniff the air as they went. They crept their way down the road and hadn't gone far before one of the hounds bayed out to tell the brothers it had picked up a bear's scent near the road. Phil and Willie got out and pulled two of the dogs from the kennel and let them work to find the trail. Once the two dogs had found the bear's scent trail, the brothers turned out the rest of the pack. The hunt was on. As Phil and Willie listened to the baying hounds racing through the brush, their ruckus told a story of the pursuit. They listened as the hounds crossed the hills and turned back toward the highway they had just left. Looking back down the road, they could see the bear streak across the same road they were on and up the hill in a large circular path as it fled the mayhem of the hounds behind it. The bear was a good-sized bear at what they guessed to be close to 250 pounds, but was no 600-pound giant. It should give the hounds a great chase. The size of the bear's head led the men to conclude that it was a male, which meant that it was probably going to run a long way before treeing. Male bears are bigger and tend to attack hounds more often than female bears do, and that isn't exactly the best scenario for houndsmen and their hounds. The brothers listened as the hounds continued to bay and could tell the bear had run right into a part of the ridge crowded with dense second-growth forest full of short trees and bushes that grow closely together creating a hedgerow of tangled plant life. It is very difficult to see through and even more difficult to get through. The trees and bushes on the hillside were so thick and tangled that Phil had a hard time making progress toward his hounds. After much effort, he finally emerged into the spruce section of the forest. He could hear the hounds baying once again and was sure they were barking as if they had treed the bear. As Phil stepped out into a recent clear cut, he could see two very large boulders towering over everything around them. He could see the bear standing on top of one of the boulders, having found temporary sanctuary from the hounds there. The bear was growling and snarling at the hounds from atop the boulder, but suddenly glanced up toward Phil. As soon as it saw him, it jumped off the boulder in his direction back into the thick brush. The brush completely obscured the exact location of the big bear, but the sounds of a fight between the bear and the hounds filled the air. The sounds were not good sounds. Phil could hear by the yelping and wailing of his hounds that the bear was trying to kill them as opposed to running away. He knew that an angry bear would kill several of his dogs in no time. As Phil got closer, he could see the hounds had pursued the bear into a funnel-shaped rock formation. He couldn't see the hounds or the bear, but read the terrain to discern what was happening. He could hear the hounds yelping and wailing and knew he had to pull them off so that the bear would leave before the hounds were killed. Phil quickly positioned himself in the opening of the funnel and approached from one side, hoping the bear would run out the other side. He could see the bear begin to move toward the opening on the far side of the funnel, and Phil dropped off a rock, pushing his way through to the brush toward his hounds. Phil bent over and stretched out his hand to take control of the first one of his hounds he found. As he glanced up, he could see the furious black bear with its mouth wide open running directly at him. 
the bear had doubled back, and probably in anger at the hounds, decided that the funnel rock formation that trapped him also trapped Phil and the hounds. Phil was still on all fours, trying to gain control of his hound, when the bear slammed into him and knocked him rolling onto his back. Phil could hear the bear growling and was terrified by the thought of being bitten by it. He raised his hands toward his face to fend off the bear's jaws and screamed as he kicked his legs at the bear in desperate self-defense. The angry bear quickly straddled him and began chewing on his hands as they were extended to push the bear away. Phil could feel the bear's teeth crunching through the flesh and bone of his hands with bites occurring in rapid succession, causing pain to shoot through his body. Time seemed to slow down and lag as is so common in these tense and terrifying situations. Imagine watching the bear's mouth open much slower than it is really happening and crunching through your hand and you will understand what Phil was experiencing. Hearing Phil's screams, his hounds leapt from the boulders landing on top of the bear, who was on top of Phil. This caused the bear to let go of Phil and flee the hounds, who followed in hot pursuit. Phil took the break in the attack to roll over to his stomach. He tried to push himself to his feet but couldn't. His hands simply refused to work. He looked down at his right hand to see the flesh completely torn away and only connected to him by a thin flap of skin. His left hand wouldn't work at all and he could see puncture marks from the bear's canines that penetrated completely through his palm. He knew the teeth must have cut some of the tendons causing the loss of function. His hands now mutilated and non-functional, Phil reached for his two-way radio. He knew he had to get Willie up here to help him get through the tangle of the second growth forest he fought through on his way in, as it would be too difficult by himself. His hands were so mangled that he couldn't work the buttons and dials to get a hold of Willie. The only thing Phil could do was yell, and he did that for about 15 minutes. Willie piped up and pushed his way through the brush toward his brother. Willie pulled Phil's shirt off and wrapped it around his brother's mangled hands. The men agreed that Phil's injuries were serious but not life-threatening. Willie grabbed his brother's radio and reached out to their friend, Gary Arbogast. He agreed to pick Phil up and take him to the hospital while Willie rounded up the hounds. Phil's injuries were bandaged enough to allow him to push his way back through the tangled brush for a mile and a half back to Highway 250. His hands hurt so much that he couldn't even jog where he was able to. When he emerged from the forest and onto the highway, Arbogast was there waiting for him. They reached out to a police officer, who escorted them to the hospital at Elkins. With the officer's escort, the 40-mile distance was covered in 35 minutes. Once at the hospital, initial examinations of Phil's injuries revealed them to be much more serious than initially believed. After the medical team cleared the injuries and punctures in Phil's flesh from debris, they x-rayed his left wrist. The images revealed that the bones of his wrist and all of the bones composing the palm of his hand were broken. As Phil stood near the nurses, he felt something wet trickling down his right thigh. The nurses investigated to find a bite wound that he must have received while he was kicking at the bear. This wound alone took twelve stitches to close. Phil was laid on a gurney and wheeled into surgery to receive pins in his left wrist and his last two hand bones. While he was under anesthesia, the separated flesh of his right hand was sewn back on. The only repair they couldn't make to his right hand was to fix the nerve to his little finger, which was severed when the bear bit the flesh from the outside portion of his hand. It's likely that he will never again have the use of his little finger on his right hand. Phil Propst is undeterred by the confrontation he had with the big black bear. He couldn't even wait for one week after being discharged before he took his hounds back out and was chasing bears once again. He had a big bandage on his right hand and his left arm was still in a sling, but was happy to be doing what he loved so much. After some reflection on his altercation with the bear, Phil says the attack was his fault. Citing the fact that he crawled into the brush very near to the bear, without an easy escape, he placed himself in an unavoidably hostile and dangerous position. He admits that his dogs had wound the bear up so much that he felt he had to defend himself when he attacked Phil. Phil admits that by climbing into the funnel, he blocked the bear's only way to get out. The only regret he has about his bear attack is that the bear bit so doggone hard. He didn't have to do that part. In West Virginia, Phil Probst's black bear attack was the first recorded bear attack in state history. Given the aggravating circumstances surrounding this attack, I can hardly call it a bear attack. 
more like a human and dog attack on a bear who defended himself just enough to get away. After reviewing the details surrounding this episode, I am left with a few questions for you. Do you think West Virginia's year-round black bear pursuit season is why they have never had a bear attack? Do you think that a firearm would have changed the outcome of this attack? Would bear spray have prevented this attack? Can you believe Phil was out chasing bears with his hounds only a week after being discharged from the hospital? What impact do you think the widespread overlogging of West Virginia had on the wildlife? I will enjoy reading and responding to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the wilderness just north of Columbia Falls, Montana. The terrain of this area features valleys at around 3,500 feet in elevation, with nearby hills reaching near the mile-high mark of 4,500 to 5,000 feet. The Trumbull Canyon Road is an excellent jumping-off spot for anyone wanting to get into the more remote areas for hunting, hiking, or general adventuring. In this area, there are nearly uninterrupted forests of pine and fir trees that stretch for miles. Along the creek bottoms, willow and alder bushes screen and shelter the white-tailed deer, elk, and moose that sneak amongst them. The berries offering up their fruit to human and animal visitors include huckleberry, thimbleberry, chokecherry, and gooseberry. Patches of stinging nettle, nodding onion, and mountain sorrel decorate the ground with their beautiful flowers and add variety to the visual cornucopia. The dominant predators of the area include cougars, wolves, coyotes, and black bears, but the topic of our episode today is the powerful brown bears of the area. On the morning of November 11th, 2018, Anders Brost was teaching a friend, Dan Hansen, to hunt elk and deer. The men had pushed their way through a few inches of snow early in the morning when they approached a very thick, tangled stand of brush. The branches of the leafless underbrush tugged at Anders' clothes and his rifle as he fought his way through it. His visibility was very limited, and he couldn't do anything about the noise of the bushes rustling against his clothes and other branches as he forced his way through. Hansen was about 150 yards away from him, filming as Anders navigated his route. As he parted the brush with effort, he looked up and noticed a big bear head rising up before him from behind a log. He immediately recognized the dish-faced profile of a grizzly bear, and he was filled with terror as he realized he had its focused attention. The bear was a mere 15 yards from him and spun quickly to face the surprise interruption to its slumber. 36-year-old Anders moved to his home he shared with his wife Annika on Trumbull Canyon Road after the two had wed, and he accepted a job at Applied Materials selling specialized bikes around the world. He's always been drawn to the mountains and even rearranged his life so that he could be where he loved to adventure and be active. Annika was from the area and knew her husband would love doing what he enjoyed there. Anders loved being outside, from skiing, biking, hiking, Rafting, fishing, and hunting he is described as spending more time outside than inside. As the bear streaked toward him, parting brush and branch as it clearly drove itself toward a confrontation with the hunter, Anders began stumbling backwards, trying to increase the distance between him and the enraged bear. He struggled to pull his rifle from his shoulder, but his efforts were hindered by the interference from the brush. His mind raced for a solution as the reality of the situation ran through his mind. He was in a dangerous situation and could do nothing about it. The only thing he could do was brace for impact and desperately hope the attack would be brief. As the bear rapidly approached, Anders quickly untangled his rifle and managed to push it between the bear and himself. The rifle barrel grazed the bear's shoulder and did nothing to slow the bear's advance. He couldn't click off his safety and didn't even have time to put his finger in the trigger guard before the bear impacted him as he toppled to his back. The bear was on top of him before he could process it and put the 1,200 pounds of force per square inch bike force to use. It sank its teeth into his right arm and shook its head back and forth forcefully like a dog with a toy. It twisted its head as it shook and Anders heard his arm bones pop under the force of the bear's jaws. The initial bite and the rending actions of the bear's jaws broke bones in his hand and his radius as well as dislocated his shoulder and hand. It then clamped down on his left hand and bit quickly and repeatedly bit into it as well. The bear then focused its attack on his left leg, clenching his ankle in its jaws. Anders managed to kick the bear a few times, but it repeated its tossing motion on his ankle, pulling him downhill several feet in the process. Anders grasped, passing by bushes, in an attempt to avoid being dragged off by the bear. 
After it shook him about, it slipped its jaws down to his boot and bit through it with no problem. Its teeth narrowly missed severing a few of his toes by piercing his boot between them. Anders could feel his boot being pulled from his foot and recalled being oddly worried about losing it. He knew it may be pivotal in his escape and getting back to safety. The force and power of the attack on his ankle had ruptured his meniscus, torn ligaments, and tendons, as well as broken his fibula. It tore open the flesh of his foot as well. As quickly as the attack had began, it ended. The last thing Anders recalls is seeing a big furry rear end retreating into the brush to his relief. He immediately started yelling to his hunting partner, Hansen, to fire over the head of the bear to keep it going away. His hunting partner reported hearing nothing during the attack and being surprised at the condition of his partner when he arrived by his side. The hunters estimate the entire attack took only 15 to 30 seconds. Anders and his hunting partner were fortunate in that the location where the attack occurred received cell service. Anders asked Hansen to call Annika so he could speak with her. She expressed concern for the lack of experience Hansen had and wanted to make sure he didn't shoot her husband. After he spoke with her, the men tried to hike out. After assisting Anders to his feet, Hansen watched as his knee bent 90 degrees in the wrong direction after just a few steps. Knowing now that hiking out was impossible and could cause greater damage, they called 911. This phone call set in motion a chain of informational relays that notified a broad network of government agencies and allowed them to triangulate the hunter's exact location. The cavalry showed up with high-powered rifles and shotguns to the relief of Anders and his hunting partner. Annika called the Kalispell Regional Medical Center and inquired as to the staff on duty. She wanted to make sure her husband had had the best of care, as she worked as an emergency room nurse at the center. Brian Summers, a criminal investigator for Montana Fish and Wildlife and leader of the Wildlife Human Action Response Team, rushed toward the scene along with three game wardens who acted as security in case the bear returned to the attack scene. The investigative crew arrived as the medical team loaded Anders into the rescue copter, dispatched by two bear air. The investigative team combed the attack scene, searching for vital clues as to what led up to the attack. They photographed everything and measured distances between tracks left in the snow. They observed the imprints of Anders' backpack in the snow as the bear drove him into the snowbank. The team analyzed the bear bed for hair or saliva samples to use to identify the bear species or even the individual bear through DNA analysis. Anders was flown to the Kalispell Regional Medical Center where Dr. Joe Bergman, specialist in treating trauma and bear maulings, was waiting for him. Bergman observed bite marks all over Anders' arms, hands, and left leg, too many to count. Being aware that when bears bite, they pull up, causing deep tissue injuries, and inject saliva containing streptococcus, staphylococcus, pseudomonas, and clostridium bacteria, which can cause gas gangrene into wounds. Local medical facilities have concocted a mixture of antibiotics, which are immediately administered to counter such infections. The injuries may look superficial, but can actually be deep tissue wounds and lead to life-threatening infections. Anders received an IV drip containing those antibiotics to prevent serious infection as soon as he arrived at KRMC. They also removed debris from his wounds. Bite information was tediously collected and the information was passed on to the investigative team for analysis. Anders spent seven days at KRMC before he was released to convalesce at home. He underwent a few months of physical rehabilitation before completely recovering. Summers and his investigative team tracked the bear, but eventually lost its trail as it continued out of the area. His samples and information were sent to a research center in British Columbia, Canada for further analysis. There was no source that indicated that the bear was euthanized or identified after the attack. Anders is recovering and has recognized there was essentially nothing he could have done to avoid the confrontation. He does have plans to expand his supplies to include a space blanket as well as a satellite tracking device to be safer. He also notes that he willingly adventured into bear country and accepted the risks of doing so. He plans to continue hunting as well as his other outdoor activities and can't wait to get back outside, where he feels fulfilled. He encourages people to go outside and enjoy the risks and rewards the wilderness offers its visitors. After studying the facts surrounding this episode, I'm left with a few questions. Do you think bear spray would have prevented this attack? Do you think this bear should have been euthanized? What do you think Anders and Hansen could have done to avoid this attack? Why wasn't this bear denned up for hibernation? 
with local farmers and ranchers in the areas of high bear density indicating that they lose between 20 and 25 percent of their corn crop to foraging bears and also report 20 to 30 cows per year being killed and fed upon by local bears seeking prey. Do you think that bear populations are being pushed into human-occupied areas? I would love to read your comments, so please post them below. Our Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode is called The Gruesome Bear Attack of Barry Gilbert. Today's episode takes place in the mountains of southwestern Montana near Yellowstone National Park at a location called Bighorn Pass. This area is remote and wild and perfect a perfect home for bears and bear researchers. Barry Gilbert was a scientist. He was a field researcher who devoted his education and career to, the, to help the scientific community understand how brown bears are affected by human traffic through their remote areas. Barry was a faculty member at Utah State University and loved what he did. Near Yellowstone Park, Barry and a research assistant learned a very valuable lesson but not what he was hoping to learn. The altitude was draining, but exhilarating as the research team crested the Bighorn Pass in the rugged southwest Montana area. It took nearly six days of hard hiking with their heavy backpacks through the still very wild and remote country they so enjoyed. After canoeing around a portion of Yellowstone Lake and nearly swamping themselves in the process, the duo was ready to accomplish their mission. The research team knew the risks and took significant precautions to avoid any problems with bears. They would camp off of the trails a good distance, as well as create physical barriers from branches and deadfalls to alert them to any curious animals, bear or otherwise. On the most notable day of their planned research, they came across a sow grizzly and her three healthy cubs. This is what they suffered for and would be a great opportunity to do some research gather data, and hope to learn how to best help the bear population. They watched as the cubs were threatened by a male bear, called a boar, and were impressed with the power and commitment of the mother bear to protect her cubs. She backed him down, and her and the cubs were on their way safely after the tent standoff. The next morning, Barry discussed circling around the bears and observing them from a viewpoint called Crowfoot Ridge. It would put the researchers much closer to the bears and allow them to gather more data. After a short hike, the scientists reached their observation point, but Barry had to urinate and walked a short distance into the bush to relieve himself. As Barry crested the top of the pass, the mother bear and her cubs crested it from the other side, in exactly the same place. Witnessing the prior day's tent standoff with the boar, and the ultra-protective nature of mother bears, Barry knew this could be very bad. By the time Barry could process the situation, the sow let out a loud woof and blurred through the surrounding undergrowth that separated the pair. A mousy smear of motion and teeth, and the next thing Barry knew, he was on the ground. The sow was quick and efficient in her assault of the perceived threat. Barry felt the bear lock onto his head and could hear and feel the tissue of his scalp being torn away, but felt no immediate pain. The sow then savagely clamped down on Barry's cheekbones and crushed them, then pulled his cheekbone out completely apart from his face. All Barry could think of was, this is how you die. As his lifeblood poured onto the ground, his body fell limp. The perceived threat now neutralized, the bear let up on her attack. The graduate student accompanying Barry yelled and chased the bear from his research partner. A team of smoke jumpers were training nearby and fortunately the helicopter pilot training with them was an experienced combat pilot who completed two tours in Vietnam. Adding to Barry's fortune, battlefield trauma surgeons were also in that same training session. If these trauma specialists had not been nearby, Barry would have certainly succumbed to his injuries very quickly. The surgery immediately after this attack saved his life and took 11 hours to complete and over 900 stitches and sutures. The hospital actually ran out of sutures due to his medical procedure. 
After the surgery, the surgeon showed Barry before pictures of his face and scalp. Barry asked the surgeon if he had ever seen this kind of damage before, and he said, Yes, but not on one person. Barry's face was eventually rebuilt, but his left eye was blind, and he had a disfigured facial structure. Barry was not bitter or angry with the bear. She was merely defending her cubs from a possible threat. She was being a good mother, and he simply happened to be at the worst possible place at that time. If you would like to read his first-hand depiction of his attack and a lot more information, it is compiled in his memoir called One of Us, A Biologist's Walk Among Bears. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the North Fork of the Shoshone River, and yes, we have been here in prior episodes. It is just east of Yellowstone National Park boundaries on the Wyoming side. In the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, you may see plenty of mule deer, elk, and moose roaming the forests of pine, fir, spruce, and aspen. You might see a coyote flit through the sagebrush or a wolf, cougar, or black bear with a recent kill if you are lucky. But of all the wonders of this area, let's hope you don't run in a grizzly bear like Tev Kelly did. On October 6, 2017, 32-year-old Tev Kelly was rifle hunting elk with his 34-year-old hunting partner, Scott Smith. They had been planning on this fall's elk hunt for some time and spent time brushing up on their skills by going to shooting ranges. They knew that success in elk hunting depends on shot placement in any conditions, no matter the wind, cold, or energy levels. Tev was an experienced hunter and professional hunting guide who enjoyed being as far back in the wilderness on his hunts as he could reasonably go. He was six feet four inches tall, but only weighed 150 pounds. He was lanky and wiry built, but the best hunters frequently are. They can get up the hills easier with their long legs and don't have to move a lot of weight either. Now, Tev had been charged by bears in the past. In fact, in 2016, he was charged two times that hunting season, on the same day. The year prior to that, Tev was also charged by a bear. For anyone who believes in the odds of any given occurrence, you might tend to believe that Tev's luck was about to run out. Well, not quite yet. Scott had actually drawn the controlled hunt tag for the hunting unit, and Tev decided to tag along for the fun. They rose before sunrise and departed camp on that Friday morning, hoping to find a bull elk of satisfactory size. Tev and Scott were glassing for elk on the day in question. If you've never hunted, that means that they were searching with binoculars or spotting scopes for animals located on adjacent ridges. This method of hunting gives the hunters a chance to see the animal they are pursuing and plan a route to stalk it. The men hiked the steep trails into the high country as the wind howled. They had continually located elk from afar, only to watch them slip away, further into higher and steeper elevations. As the wind forced the hunters into a slouching resistance, it also masked their scent from animals near them. Given the steepness of the terrain, they would appreciate any advantage they could gain. Now Tev didn't pack bear spray with him on hunts. He was simply unconvinced it would work in all situations, and given today was very windy, he was right on the money. Bear spray would have only been diluted in the gusts of 25 to 30 miles an hour, and he may have been completely defenseless afterward with its contents being exhausted. The only thing apart from his rifle that he packed would be his 1911 45 caliber super semi-automatic pistol. It has long been the favorite sidearm of many a military man for about 100 years and is still the pinnacle in terms of power and performance. The pair managed to climb high enough that they had a great angle on a large bull elk. Scott leveled his rifle and took aim from 327 yards at the bull's right shoulder. With a slow squeeze of the trigger, the report of the rifle echoed down the valley as the bull tumbled and then rested down the hill a short distance. The men celebrated upon seeing the bull collapse, knowing their hard work had paid off with a successful harvest. It took a while, but they made their way to the carcass of the bull and knew that this was where the work begins. They placed their backpack and rifles uphill from the bull's carcass to prevent them from being bloodied during the gutting of the bull. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with hunting, gutting an animal is when you cut a large incision from the animal's throat area through its rib cage and abdomen and ending at its anus. Next, the windpipe is gripped and pulled from the animal's body. 
As the windpipe is pulled, it removes the animal's lungs and esophagus, which pulls the entrails of the gut along with it. By the time a hunter is done removing the guts of a large elk, the remaining carcass is usually quartered for easier packing and retrieval. Scott and Tev knew that the carcass weight of a bull elk would be at least 250 pounds if they removed the bones and took only the meat. That would be two trips to the carcass for each of them and returning with about 60 pounds of meat for each man, each time. An alternative is to leave the bone in the quarter of the elk, which will take less time, as a quarter can be cut with a bone saw in only a few minutes. If each round trip took them three hours, they would have the head, hide, and meat out in the better part of a day. Spending time on the carcass cutting meat away from the bones would mean spending more time in the territory of a very smart and hungry predator. The approach to where the bull carcass was was open and clear for 200 yards in each direction. The bull had died in an area similar to a small box canyon. The men had nowhere to go in the event of a problem. While the men gutted the bull elk, they discussed the need to suspend the rest of the carcass by rope from a tree. Even without the bones in the carcass, it would take them two trips to pack it out, and leaving the bones in the carcass would make roping it up into a tree easier and take less time. This is a common sense practice many hunters use as it makes it harder for bears to claim the meat as their own food cache. As the men were bent over the bull's carcass, an odd-sounding snap broke the silence behind them. They had just been looking around the carcass, planning everything out a few moments before, and hadn't seen anything alarming. Tev turned around to see what the source of the snap was, and that is when everything went into slow motion. He heard himself yelling, Bear! 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 and watched as a huge grizzly bear leapt over a deadfall log and bounded the short distance toward him and Scott. For some reason, each of the hunters moved in a different direction, confusing the bear momentarily. It paused for a second, as if it were deciding between the men who it would attack first. Tev took this brief pause to fire his pistol into a log, and the bear didn't flinch. Tev and Scott knew the bear had been completely aware of what it was running up on. With the cliff behind the men, they had no choice but to stand their ground and see if the grizzly charging them was bluffing. The grizzly immediately started sprinting toward the men once again. Tev could see every detail of the bear. It was fat, and the energy from each bound rippled through its body as it closed in on the men. Its head and ears were up to take in any information, and it stretched its paws forward with each bound, coming closer each time. As the bear neared the hunters, it stood up like a lineman in football. Given the bear was now a mere twenty yards away, Tev's next shot was not a warning shot. He aimed a little high on the bear as its head bobbed up and down with each bound toward them. He hoped to hit its head, but after firing his forty-five, was not positive where his bullet struck, but he knew he had hit the bear. Tev and Scott watched as the bear tumbled at the impact of the bullet. The grizzly rolled down the hill about ten yards and lay still. Tev thought he had killed it, but after about ten seconds it regained its feet. He was convinced it was about to renew its attack. He had witnessed how this bear had no fear of humans and warily watched as the bear staggered in a circle. The grizzly was clearly stunned and severely injured, but still a very potent threat. As soon as it gained its bearings, they watched it stumble back into the forest. Right after firing the initial pistol shot and watching the bear tumble down the mountain, Tev and Scott ran for their rifles. They knew that the now wounded grizzly wouldn't tip his hat and forget about the meat or the men. Tev didn't fire again at the bear because he was unsure of exactly what the law said about killing a grizzly in self-defense. He, for some reason, was under the impression that once the bear was departing, he could no longer consider it a threat. Recent lawsuits and citations of hunters in similar situations blurred through his mind. In his hesitance, he granted a wounded and angry grizzly permission to threaten himself, his hunting partner, and anyone else who may have the misfortune of stumbling upon the bear. With the bear now out of sight, the hunters quickly loaded their first load of elk quarters onto their backs. Before departing, they attempted to hide the rest of the elk meat in a boulder cleft, thinking it may be safe there until they returned. They guessed their packs at about 100 pounds each, and for Tev, that was quite a load. Scott weighed about 220 pounds, so he wasn't as burdened by the weight, but 150-pound Tev struggled to keep pace as the men made their way back toward their truck. The bear had left the scene in the same direction the hunters had to travel to return to their truck. The entire hike out was fraught with nerve-wracking glances and worried study of the trail ahead. They arrived at their truck at around 5 p.m. 
They immediately put the elk quarters they hauled out into the back of their truck and headed back toward Wapiti and the cell service they knew would allow them to call for help. Once in cell service, they reached out to the Wyoming Game and Fish Department and reported the incident to the authorities. Game Warden Travis Crane met at Tev's home to review the hunter's stories and decide their next steps. The next day, Tev and his father Ned, as well as Scott, Game Warden Crane, and biologist Luke Ellsbury hiked back into where the hunters stashed the elk carcass. As they hiked, each of the men yelled and make as much noise as they reasonably could to make sure to avoid surprising any of the area's several grizzlies. As they neared the location, their hearts sank as they observed bear tracks from more than one bear, as well as scat all around the elk carcass. The meat was now missing, which indicated that a grizzly had claimed it and undoubtedly cached it nearby. They realized they were standing in the middle of a bear cache and knew a grizzly would not take kindly to this trespass. The grizzly that had initially charged the hunters was blonde in color. As they scanned the area, searching for the bear that was certainly laying up in watch over its cache, a darker grizzly caught their eye. It was about the same size as the blonde grizzly, estimated at about 400 pounds, but was clearly not the same bear. It didn't have any obvious wounds, which would be a clear indication of being the same bear. This grizzly was not happy to see the five men. It chuffed and woofed to let the men know it was there and that they had better leave. It stood in plain sight atop a deadfall pine tree to make sure they had seen it as it glared in their direction. Being very familiar with bears, the men all knew what was going to come next. If the bear didn't run away at the sight of the men, they knew they were in for a fight for their lives. As this darker grizzly charged the men, Ellsbury fired off two warning shots in the bear's direction. He was trying to scare the bear, but was concerned at its boldness. As the bear continually made its presence known, the hunters quickly pulled the remains of the elk carcass from the sticks and duff the bear had placed over it. They nervously tied the elk quarters to their backpacks and the entire party fled the scene in a hurry. Upon arriving at the truck, Tev's hands wouldn't quit shaking as the intensity and danger of the situation overwhelmed him momentarily. He and his father made a video about the incident and posted it to social media to make sure hunters and hikers were aware of the incident. I could find no source indicating either man suffering from anxiety or nightmares following the incident. Wyoming game and fish officers formed a task group to search for the wounded grizzly, but all efforts came up fruitless. The wounded grizzly was never found. Despite being charged by grizzlies sometimes multiple times in a single hunting season, Tev Kelly refused to let the incident keep him from doing what he loves. Before the week was up, he was out guiding another hunter on an elk hunt in prime grizzly territory. Regarding the incident of the grizzly and the elk hunters, Tev explains he has been within 100 yards of bears more than a dozen times, and he considers them enchanting. However, he does indicate they are less enchanting when they are trying to kill you. He also expressed sadness in knowing there is a wounded grizzly out there. Around the Cody, Wyoming area, grizzlies charging hunters is not uncommon, and incidents tend to peak during hunting season. In the state of Wyoming, there are said to be 600 grizzly bears, with the vast majority living in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem surrounding the park of the same name. Since the beginning of record-keeping regarding grizzly bear attacks in 1967, a total of 23 people have been killed in Montana and Wyoming. That is an average of one human death every two years due to grizzly bear attacks each year for the last 51 years. Since the year 2010, grizzlies have killed eight people in Montana and Wyoming combined, with seven of these fatalities occurring in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I am left with a few questions for you. Do you think this grizzly was a dinner bell bear that came in upon hearing the report of the hunting rifle? Could bear spray have prevented the injury to the bear? Were you surprised when another grizzly showed up and claimed the elk carcass? I will enjoy reading and replying to your thoughts, so post them in the comment section below and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the remote and sparsely populated Canadian province of Saskatchewan. The beautiful location of McKee Lake is nestled among the innumerable lakes in the northwest part of the province. The area is practically one huge lake, interrupted by small stands of pine and fir trees. There are also birch and aspen trees as well. The terrain is rolling forests and beautiful lakes and ponds. 
There are moose, wolves, deer, and black bears in very high numbers. The fishing is amazing and the recreational opportunities are endless, with canoeing being one of the favorites. Stephanie Blaze was 44 years old and visiting the family cabin for a week with her husband and two children. Her father, Hubert, had stayed at the cabin the prior week, and she needed to call him to tell him Curtis, her husband, had repaired the water pump. The Blaze family was well practiced at remote living and wilderness safety. Their only means of communication at such a remote location was by satellite phone, which required a clear view of the sky for the best connection. Stephanie and Ely, her nine-year-old son, went outside to talk with Grandpa. Once they walked the short distance to a nearby opening in the trees, Stephanie realized she'd forgotten the antenna needed for best reception and instructed her son to run back to the cabin and get it real quick. He scampered back toward the cabin, and Hubert listened once again to his daughter explain the water pump dilemma. Hubert was very proud of his daughter, and she gave him very good reason to be. She had completed her bachelor's degree in human justice and her master's degree in elementary education. Her passport had the stamp of 37 nations, and she taught school in Kuwait and Taiwan, as well as served on the UN Human Rights Commission in Geneva, Switzerland. There was no arguing about her intellect, but her personality was even more impressive. She was described as a loving person and a sweetheart by most who knew her. She was particularly important to her father as he lost her sister at 19 years of age in a car accident in the early 90s and his wife to breast cancer in 2008. They were brought closer by the tragedy in their lives. Hubert resumed listening to Stephanie after hearing her order Ely to fetch the antenna. Suddenly a strange gurgling noise broke through on the line. He called his daughter's name in an attempt to understand what was happening, but there was no response. The sounds coming from her end of the connection were grunting and growling noises, not words. This went on for a few minutes before Hubert hung up, thinking it may have been a connection problem. Hubert called his daughter back, but was not able to reconnect. A few minutes earlier, Ely had run to the cabin and grabbed the antenna and was on his way back to his mother's side, but as he approached, he could see a horrible sight. The nine-year-old boy saw the bear attacking his mother and turned and ran to get his father. The boy stammered out the situation to his father and Curtis grabbed a pepper spray and a gun. He sprinted to his wife and yelled and sprayed the bear with pepper spray in an attempt to run it off and stop the attack. The bear spray seemed only to enrage the bear, as it simply intensified its attack and stubbornly refused to leave his prey. Curtis knew he had to shoot the bear and fired once, but the bear continued the attack. Curtis fired a second shot and the bear dropped, ceasing the attack. Curtis immediately rendered first aid to Stephanie and noticed she was not breathing and had no pulse. He started CPR and then called Hubert for advice. After a considerable amount of time, Curtis realized he had done all he could do, and his wife and the mother of his children was now dead. Hubert and Curtis had authorities come out and investigate the attack and take possession of Stephanie's remains. The bear's corpse was taken and a necropsy was performed on it. It revealed the black bear to be a male and older for that area, but no other details could be found out about the bear. The attack was labeled an unprovoked and predatory attack. A GoFundMe page was created for the children and raised about $25,000 per child that their father indicated would go toward their education. Stephanie Blaze's attack was the first fatality caused by a black bear in Saskatchewan since 1983. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode whisks us away to about 100 miles north of Phoenix, Arizona, to a place just outside of Prescott called Groom Creek. It isn't exactly the back 40 here, as there are homes all around this rural development. There are even a few small businesses nearby. The terrain is hilly and covered with stands of spruce, pine, and juniper trees. There are an average of 300 trees per acre here, which is high density. The wildlife in the area includes mule deer, elk, pronghorn, antelope, turkey, and javelinas, to name a few. The dominant predators in this area include mountain lions, coyotes, foxes, bobcats, and black bears. It is in this scenic and peaceful setting that our episode takes place today. At 7.40 a.m. on Friday, June 16, 2023, 66-year-old Stephen Jackson was sitting down at a table on his rural property to enjoy a morning cup of coffee. 
He was building a cabin on some land he owned and was just beginning to plan his work day. He was from Tucson and recently relocated to his land in Yavapai County on a quiet wooded lot. Stephen had been camping here regularly and enjoyed the peace and serenity. Whenever he came up to work on his cabin, Stephen would sleep on a hard shell pop-up tent mounted on a rack over the back of his truck bed. It was made by a company called Roof Nest and was the state of the art in camping. It provided an elevated sleeping area which would be sure to keep you safe from any animals which may wander into your camp. It had a reduced vulnerability to being attacked by an animal like a bear who would find a ground-based tent easy access, even though this kind of encounter rarely happens. Users describe this means of tent camping as granting a sense of security more than ground tenting it. Stephen's neighbor, David Montano, described him as extremely intelligent and very friendly. The two had exchanged phone numbers when they first met several years back and had been friendly neighbors ever since. Montano liked Jackson and enjoyed how happy he always was when he was up on his property. He and Jackson's other neighbors would while away hours on his property, chatting. He looked forward to the completion of Jackson's home and continuing to build their friendship. As Stephen prepared his coffee, he set up his typical morning ritual, a comfy camping chair by his table only a few yards from his cabin site. As he relaxed, he had no way of knowing there would be a dangerous visitor to his site on this day. With Stephen's back facing the wooded part of his lot, he couldn't possibly have seen the very large male black bear approaching him. Bears have plantigrade feet, which means their weight is distributed over a larger area like human feet. Their feet have thick rubbery pads similar to dogs that flex around any object they step on. This may keep twigs from snapping or prevent other sounds while they approach their prey. While I was in the back country of Alaska, I once had an enormous brown bear shake the ground with thudding footsteps as he approached me, stop, then slip away without as much as a twig snap. Nobody witnessed precisely how the black bear closed in on Stephen, but his neighbors suddenly heard him yelling for help. They rushed outside to see Stephen in the grasp of a huge black bear, clearly terrified. Neighbors began flocking to the attack site. Many of them yelled and screamed at the bear, trying to frighten it off. Others got into their vehicle and approached the area, honking their horns, but none of it scared the bear away. As the bear bit and clawed Stephen, the man yelled and tried pushing the bear away from him. With all the din raised by the neighbors, the bear began to drag Stephen away, about 75 yards down a slope. That is when one of them went to get Montano. Montano worked for the government, and as part of his training, was well trained with firearms. He firmly believed that a firearm in the hands of a trained person can save lives, but on this day, he was painfully wrong. Montano was sleeping when he heard a thunderous pounding on his front door. He leapt out of bed and ran to the door to see what all the ruckus was about. As he opened the door, he witnessed an exasperated neighbor telling him to get his gun because a bear had Stephen. Incredulous, he scrambled to grab his rifle. By the time Montano arrived at Stephen's lot, he was nowhere to be found. Bystanders directed him to look down the hill, and he quickly made his way through the trees and down the slope. As he searched for Stephen, he could see the bear standing over him. The bear was eating Stephen's lifeless body and slowly dragging Stephen further away. He raised his rifle and fired once, and the bear immediately rolled off of Stephen. Knowing how a dead bear can quickly become a partly dead bear, he fired once more into the bear's limp corpse. Montano and other neighbors quickly called the Yavapai Sheriff's Department and requested medical help at the location. They ran to Stephen's side to see if they might be able to help him. Stephen was a mess, with large bite wounds, and was not responding to them. By the time the police arrived on the scene, they found Stephen had died from loss of blood and trauma. His smile was erased in his painful expression of death. Arizona Fish and Game Department officials showed up and completed a brief investigation. They indicated that there was nothing left out that would attract the bear to Stephen's lot, he hadn't left food out or spilled anything that a bear might find enticing. Stephen had followed the Bee Bear Aware guidelines in terms of keeping a clean campsite free from trash and food. They also indicated there were no reports of an aggressive bear in the area. It seemed this bear had never shown up on their radar as a problem bear. They took the bear's body for a necropsy to gain insight into why this attack happened. 
The report indicated that the bear was very large, weighing 360 pounds. It had a good amount of fat and had no sign of illness or disease. A rabies test was performed on the bear and came back negative. Authorities labeled the incident a predatory attack and struggled to explain just why it happened. The bear's stomach contents were removed. It had tissues from Stephen's body mixed in with some seeds and plants it had consumed previously. At our Patreon link below, you will find pictures of the attack scene and the dead bear after Montano shot it. There are no pictures of Stephen's injuries there, but the pictures are always great to analyze for context. There is nothing particularly graphic there except the dead bear. Stephen's remains were removed and transported to the coroner's office for analysis, but it didn't take a medical professional to explain his death. Authorities thanked Montano for dispatching the predatory bear before it could hurt or kill anyone else. They said that they avoided having to conduct a hunt for the bear since it was killed at the attack site. His neighbors, friends, and family were saddened by the manner and suddenness of Stephen's passing. Montano recalled how Stephen was looking forward to enjoying his remaining time at his favorite place on Groom Creek, and now he will stay there eternally. Since 1990, 15 people have been attacked by black bears in Arizona. Stephen's attack was only the second human fatality in over 12 years. There are reportedly only 2,000 to 2,500 black bears in Arizona, which makes Stephen's attack even more puzzling. After reviewing the details of this episode, I have some questions for you. We have reported in our episode on bear repellents and attractants that bears are drawn to the smell of coffee grounds. Do you think it was Stephen's early morning cup of joe that brought the bear to him? Do you think bear spray would have prevented this attack? Does this attack show you that precautions like being bear aware around your campsite and sleeping in elevated accommodations are not enough to avoid a predatory bear attack? Are you surprised at the massive size of the bear that killed Stephen Jackson? I will enjoy reading and responding to your comments, so please post them below and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. When you think of Florida, you probably think of palm trees, sandy beaches, alligators, and sunshine. Many people from all over the world travel to its relaxing and warm environment to escape colder, more stressful locations. Perhaps you will rethink your opinions and vacation destinations after this report. Florida is home to its own unique subspecies of black bear known as Ursus americanus floridanus. The subspecies is remarkably robust with an estimated population of just over 4,000 bears statewide. Today's episode takes us to the central Florida town of DeBerry, just north of the entertainment mecca of Orlando. On January 13th of 2022, just after 8 p.m., Austin Kennedy was outside enjoying the fresh air when a black bear was observed walking through the area. Not a common sight, this drew the attention of the neighbors as they walked through the area. The female black bear and her three 100-pound cubs retreated up a nearby tree for protection. Neighbors Mike and Jenny were walking down the sidewalk. The mother bear shimmied down the tree and began aggressively approaching the couple. They began yelling and waving their arms to scare her off, and it seemed to work. They held their ground and kept their eyes focused on the irate mama bear. It was at that pivotal moment that Aidy exited her home across the street from the confrontation to take her dog for a walk down Madeira Street. The mama bear immediately redirected her attention to A.D. and her now barking canine. At the sight of the aggravated bear, A.D. turned and ran away as fast as she could, a potentially deadly mistake. The sow quickly overtook her and leapt onto her back, slamming A.D.'s head against the ground, nearly causing her to lose consciousness. The bear began clawing her lower back and head, as well as biting her lower back, during the attack. The attack was over nearly as suddenly as it began as neighbors alerted by A.D.'s screams converged to frighten the bear off. The bear and her cubs disappeared into the twilight, leaving A.D. and her dog confused and terrified. A.D.'s dog disappeared into the night as well. Volusia County Sheriff's deputies were contacted and quickly responded to the incident. After a brief interview with A.D., the sow and her three cubs were observed hiding in the canopy of a nearby pine tree. Animal control officers used a tranquilizer gun to sedate the sow. The sow was euthanized per Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission policy based on her lack of fear of people. The three cubs were deemed able to survive on their own and were permitted to flee the area without being euthanized over the objections of A.D. A.D. expressed gratitude for receiving relatively minor injuries and that her dog was not injured during the confrontation. 
This is the 14th recorded bear attack in Florida since records began in 1976. Black bears were removed from the threatened species list in Florida in 2012 and now can be found over much of the state. Some of the names of the people involved in this video have been changed to protect their privacy. The top link in the resource article of this video links to the actual 911 call from a concerned neighbor. The link to the FWC below also provides human bear incidents listed on a map of the area. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. We'll help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country.